Okay. So nice to see you all and uh, uh, thanks very much uh, all. I think we should thank all the attendants, uh, uh, people who spare their Saturday to listen to us. Um, I, I, I was just trying to see if uh, there is really an optimis optimism of the will for the left. But anyway, let's assume that we all have it and uh, start this session by saying a few words. Uh, first, uh, uh, that the idea of a round table is that uh, participants uh, start with uh, short interventions and uh, uh, give uh, the possibility uh, uh, to uh, the others who are also participating to, to exchange views among themselves and have, of course, some people or some questions from the attendants, but not too many. The idea is that you speak among themselves. You just talk uh, to each other. Um, the, the idea is... Uh, uh, as I, I read this optimism of the will, is uh, if we can escape from what usually happens uh, during crisis, that uh, exiting from the crisis happens most usually against the working classes, against the most vulnerable members of the society. Because these crises, which are capitalist crises, have uh, as uh, a, a way to be reborn uh, the destruction of others. And uh, the question is, if at this time, when we have a triple crisis, the ever staying with us, uh, this uh, long one crisis of, uh, of uh, climate destruction, uh, together with the pandemic and the economic crisis. I don't know which, I, mean, I don't agree that the economic crisis is only the result of the pandemic. It, it was with us even before the pandemic. But anyway, we have this triple crisis. And the question is, um, what can, uh, if the left, uh, and I insist uh, on the adjective, uh, the, the transformative left, in order not to, to, to have misunderstandings among ourselves, if the transformative left can uh, use this, say, window of opportunity that some people say has opened by this crisis to try and uh, uh, promote uh, its values and its policies for which tend to a new, uh, to, to another vision of, of, of society. So this is more or less what uh, uh, is, uh, what we really want to, to examine in this round table. And um, what, uh, the way I suggest we proceed, in fact, you have agreed already, is that um, I, I, I will put to you uh, three questions. Uh, after, well, uh, the, the intervention, the original intervention should not be, uh, at least in the first one and the first and second one, more than uh, uh, four minutes. Uh, three to four minutes, then uh, I have some questions from the attendants, not many, and then we'll uh, come again in each session with uh, some minutes of uh, exchange of views among ourselves, and I will also try to, to create uh, problems to you by showing your contradictions. <laughs> Anyway, so the, the first question, which you already know, I mean, I mean, those who have participated, but I repeat it for the attendance. 
is, uh, is this. All people in Europe, especially those working in restaurants and bars, in the tourist industry, the professionals, the owners of small enterprises, the artists, and other categories of working people, suffer the economic effects of partial and total lockdowns. Some of them are reluctant to comply with the restrictions and in several cases express in a violent way their anger and frustration. In this context, it is not surprising that the extreme and populist right try to take advantage of these negative popular feelings. And my question is, are you satisfied with the way your country's social movements, trade unions, and the transformative left, which most of you are part of, are responding to this extremely difficult situation? This is the question. Of course, I don't expect to say that you are not, but uh, let's see what you will say. We start uh, according to the table that I have in front of me, which has been put by Angelina. First, uh, Marga Ferre, who is uh, a co-president of Transform Europe. Marga. And please, you. before you start, I will, I will just uh, address to you what uh, the Greek government uh, says uh, as uh, the only way to avoid uh, the dangers of the pandemic, uh, show personal responsibility, which means self-discipline. So uh, I don't, it's not easy for me to look all the time at uh, uh, my mobile to see if you exceed the time, but uh, you could also try to confine yourselves to four minutes. Okay, Marga. I will try, I will try. Thank you, Harris, thank you very much, and thank you for all the attendance to listen to this debate, which I think is quite interesting. Let me start saying that uh, some months ago, a friend of mine who is a Brazilian leader of the landless movement, uh, a great activist, told me that we, the Marxists, we don't have the right to be pessimist. It's like uh, defying uh, the Gramsci sentence of the optimism of the will, of the pessimism of the intelligence. And I think his sentence is related also, Harris, to the idea to we must the duty to we have the duty to see the reality in a scientific way. So I don't know if I agree with your question when you ask me if we are satisfied or not. With a, you know, it's not a personal satisfaction, but to see in a try to be objective way how is the things going on, at least in my country, which is Euro, uh, Spain and the rest of Europe, in terms of the reaction you know, of not only the working class, but the social movements or even other parts of society, uh, the crisis we are suffering. So, uh, in this first uh, brief intervention, I would like to focus in three, I think, sectors who. Uh, we must to analyze how they mobilize themselves. No? The first one is the traditional uh, social movement sector, which has had an objective problem to mobilize itself in this crisis, which is clearly the lockdown or the non possibility of going to the street to follow the traditional way the left and the social movements uh, protest, which is going to the streets in the bigger demonstration, the better. And I think also, Harris, we must take this into account because this is a shift of the way in which the social movements demonstrate themselves, the, their protest is not, uh, maybe we are in a facing of a change, you know, how come must to be change the way we protest ourselves. But the second also, it's also a, a, a very delicate issue is that when we live in a terrible health crisis, it's not easy to go to the streets against a government who, even if it is right wing government or a progressive one as we have in Spain, uh, is trying to do something in a very dramatic situation like the pandemic. You know? So I think these two objective limits does not uh, drop us to understand that the lack of movement on the streets in a lot of countries in Europe means that there is no reaction, not at all. I think we must understand that there is a reaction, but maybe not in the traditional way the left used to protest. 
is related to social movements, meaning that the ecological movement is there, the protest against the climate change, or I mean their understanding of the climate change as a problem, I'm sure is there, and also new problems that arose during this crisis, particularly for the young people, for the precarious workers, and uh, the mobilization we expect, or the reaction we expect to have when the confinement it will be not so hard in the next month. So this is social movements as I see it. No? Maybe we have the exception in Poland with the movement of women against the uh, abortion law, which was really massive and amazing uh, alliances they created in Poland to protest against this law. The second sector we, I think we, we must to focus on is the class struggle in a traditional way, because we have seen in different countries that there is, of course, a reaction of the workers in those sectors and factories who has been closed or has been, you know, put in brackets and the risk of unemployment or uh, the kickoff of a lot of, um, of workers. And uh, there's something that has changed also, I think, in this uh, question of the traditional class struggle movements in this pandemic. I, I think it's important, I think we are going to come back later on this, which is, Everybody agrees all around the world that, that the heroes of this pandemic is the working class. I mean, in a moment where the postmodernism plus neoliberalism tried to avoid any kind of epic narrative, uh, the working class arose against with an epic, uh, not narrative, but reality, demonstrating that in crisis moment, the workers are there. No? Not workers, human beings using their work to help each other. And it's something important in terms of the uh, narrative the left has to keep going on for the next uh, future. And I think really it is important. I must say that in my country, I, I don't think in others, but in my country, Spain, the trade union, Comisiones Obreras, which is my trade union, by the way, it means worker commission has taken a leading role during this pandemic. Uh, in the demand of public uh, services, the health, the protecting the workers, and things like that. I think it was the only social movement clearly visible uh, during the pandemic in my country. I think in Belgium also, they take a, a really beautiful role. So we have also public services protesting, also defending the health system. We have teachers and educators defending uh, public health, but not defending their uh, salaries, but defending the existence, the mere existence of the public services and improve them and to demand more money and more resources for them. But also we have outside the class struggle, as you mentioned before, one particular sector very interesting to analyze in this particular moment, which is the petite bourgeoisie, which is the small and medium enterprises who has going to be sweep off the map because of the concentration of capital after this crisis. This is my, my intention. Let me say my last sentence regarding to the third group, no? social movement, class struggle, and the third one, which is the one you refer at the beginning. We have seen all around Europe the protests of the far right mixed with deniers of the pandemia and mixed with group of uh, followers of the conspiracy theories uh, during this pandemic. This mix, which is a particular fauna, no? has arisen quite violently, by the way, in Germany, in Spain and in different countries. I don't see there uh, a huge movement, but clearly connected. And we must take care about this because at least in Spain, I don't know in the rest of the country, and it's a question for you, some media is trying to include far, uh, leftist protesters in, inside those protests. No? It's like putting in the same balance, far right and, and far left, no? uh, which is what's not true. No? So we see these three movements uh, during this pandemic, and I think the change and the shifts inside all of them is something we must take really, uh, I mean, take a look on what are going to be developed in the near future. Your microphone, Harris, we cannot hear you. Thank you very much, uh, Marga. I, I, I think that you managed to, to give me the right answer to my intentionally provocative question, which is mainly directed to, to the parties of the left. But on this, I, I will, we will come back later on. Jan, now, uh, Jan uh, Lelang, who is the president of Espas Marx France. Okay. I will try to speak in English. Ah, my English good. is not so good, but uh, as we have short time. 
Um, I will try to answer to the provocative question of Harris, uh, saying that I think to, in my country, but it's not only in my country, uh, uh, the, the COVID crisis is a kind of trap for the left. Why? Because um, when a left activist or left responsible uh, see the size of the crisis, the, the first response is to say that they were right. And we were right. We were right about the, so the problem of mondialization. We were right about the healthcare liberalization system. We were right about ecological crisis. We were, we were right on all the, 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 the question uh, of uh, the COVID uh, problem. But the problem is that people don't care that we were right about this. People don't care uh, of our uh, wisdom in the past. Uh, what they want is a solution for the present. And we know it. We know it that we cannot just say we were right about liberalization, we were right about mondialization, we were right about liberalism, we were right about the uh, liberalization of the healthcare. It's not, it's not their, que their question. Their question is, what is the exit? And they want a short-term exit because a lot of people have short-term problems. And because of this, we, we have a second position. In the same time, saying we were right, we are trying to save the system. In, we, and we cannot say that we can organize right now bifurcation. And the main problem is that uh, I think we, we don't try to organize a, a long-term vision uh, which could begin with a political choice right now because in, uh, people have so many uh, financial problems, have so many employment problems that we want to save all the enterprise, we also save all the other activity and when, when you see the leftist program, program the, the truth is that we want to save all the system, even the, best, the worst part of the system, because all the system is in crisis and we don't know what to do in spite of uh, organized huge main save plan for all the economy. And I think we are in a kind of schizophrenia between our uh, position saying we were right and, and the fact that uh, in the present we say, okay, so we were right, but right now we have just saved all uh, the function, uh, all the um, all the system, and and that's why it's a trap. And I I think we definitely need to assume that we have to organize bifurcation right now. We have to organize rupture right now. And we if we don't do it during the crisis. It's like for the financial crisis 10 years ago, we will never do it. If you don't organize bifurcation during the crisis, you will never organize bifurcation. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, Jan, sorry. Uh, well, now it's Danai, Danai Kolchida, uh, who is the, the director of Nikos Poulantzis Institute, a Greek woman. Thank you, Harris. Thanks to Transform for, organize this, for organizing this discussion. Um, I will agree with what Marga said that in order to answer whether we are uh, happy with the ways the movements and the left responded to the crisis, we have to, to acknowledge the, the context. So um, Marga is right, but I have to add that between the two waves of the pandemic, uh, we noticed that at least in Greece, but I think elsewhere in Europe as well, a significant change of people's attitudes. In March, what prevailed was the primary fear for one's life, so people were much more eager to comply with their restrictive measures. Uh, this fact, combined with the fact that the majority perceived the pandemic as a natural disaster, something that no one, including the governments, was not to blame for, made it very difficult for the left and the movement to politicize the, the discourse effectively. Now, during the second wave of the pandemic, I think that things are quite different. First of all, people are not only psychologically tired, but also, as Harris pointed out in his question, they are financially exhausted and they are much more... Uh, fearing the danger of a total destruction of their businesses or the loss of their jobs. 
Uh, in this context, so uh, I think that the left and the movement did try to uh, to politicize the discourse since the beginning, and they made an argument that I find myself really important that it is wrong to perceive the situation as an unresolved conflict between the need to protect the population's health on the one hand and the need for the economy to function on the other. And so all the, the proposals that the left made uh, during the, the crisis uh, were to support small businesses and the preservation of jobs and the income of those that suffer losses. And it was not only in order to deal with in order to to deal with the economic and social consequences and to express the necessary solidarity, but it was also a way to make sure that the lockdown measures will be embraced and respected by the people, that the the social cohesion will be preserved, and so that people will be willing to to support the, a, a collective uh, way out. What is uh, for me, important to discuss, however, I, I draw this from the Greek experience. I don't know if this is the case in the rest of Europe. Uh, the Greek government uh, dealt with the crisis only using authoritarianism and shifting people's responsibility towards the, the citizens. Um, the problem is that the, all critical voices have been um, targeted by, by the government as conspiracy theorists, uh, as people who deny science. This includes also uh, the leader of the opposition, Alex Tsipras, or major uh, newspapers that made some revelations about weaknesses of the healthcare system. And in my view, this is a dangerous pathway, not only for democracy, that all critical voices are targeted, but for science itself. I think this is something also that the left should discuss uh, the, um, the interdependence of scientific and political discourse, the ideological uh, use of science, because if we start uh, thinking that everything that the government says is scientific truth and no one can contest it, then we are in difficult times, not only for democracy, but for the science itself. Uh, I will close with uh, a remark made by Tsipras in a recent interview that I find it very important that criticism is not only a democratic right, but it is also the only way uh, science itself advances. So maybe we should start discussing especially transform as a think tank about this as well. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Danai. Uh, now it's uh, Paolo Ferrero, the vice president of the left, as I have just heard, is the new name of uh, the party. Bon, I don't know why, tous. but... Je, je vais de parler en français. All Et right. Merci. Good afternoon. I will try to speak French. I would like to thank you for giving me the possibility to speak. I think what is obvious is that the pandemic has led to a, a social and an economic crisis. I think as uh, the left, we have to not only respond to the economic crisis, also the social crisis and the health crisis. If we fail to do that, if we fail to meet the various dimensions of the crisis, I think we're opening the door to the right-wing parties. So I believe that uh, we need to think about both finding a solution for people to you know, be at work, yes, but also healthy. Both aspects are central, I think. And this is particularly true, of course, for small businesses, uh, tradespeople, craftsmen, uh, what you could call the uh, uh, middle uh, class. Uh, these people uh, obviously need to be supported both uh, to ensure they remain healthy, but that they can earn uh, a living. And I think this is something that the whole of the middle class wants across Europe. They want to continue working as if COVID did not exist. Our response to that has to be uh, to uh, uh, or orientated towards 
providing some sort of state support, financial support, so that these people do not have to work and they can still live. Uh, otherwise, we'll be in a crazy situation. I think this is something that has been demanded uh, very little uh, in certain countries such as Italy. So what we need to do is demand that uh, the state does whatever is needed to ensure that people can still live without having to go out to work and take the risk of becoming infected. Then we're saying also we want, because this is key, to avoid redundancies. No one should be losing their job and short-term uh, uh, unemployment systems have to be used. I think that uh, we need as uh, uh, the left to be able to have uh, a double message here, which means let's support the middle class, let's not abandon the middle class to the right wing, and let us support also workers, employees. Uh, so this is a little bit the message here. Uh, we need to speak clearly about both those dimensions. Now, moving on to something else. And again, I'm focusing here on the middle class. Uh, an important dimension of the crisis here is uh, the concept of revolt. I studied the uh, workers' struggles of 1969, and I saw at the time that when trade unions were very weak, workers uh, revolted against the system. Why? Because there was no other way for them to be heard or to demand any change. After this phase of revolt, of uh, extreme, let's say, uh, 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 demands, then trade unions started becoming involved and negotiated uh, uh, improvements. I think neoliberalism has actually destroyed all of the possibilities of contesting that we used to have in 1960s, the 1970s and the 1980s. There is no way for people now to actually demand real change. And a lot of people, uh, I think, go out into the street and try to come up with a message. We've seen that with the yellow vests in France. They try to express some sort of uh, demand. Uh, they want to share a message, but unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be working. And what happened in France, when you look at the, the, the Yellow Vests movement. First, uh, nothing happens, and the Yellow Vest movement is criticized, but then, in a second phase, you can start building some sort of bargaining and social mediation, and then eventually, yes, that is how you can achieve change. Uh, and uh, I don't quite know how to express this, but if we want change, then I think uh, there has to be some sort of revolt slash uh, uh, public uh, uh, demonstration against uh, what is going wrong in society today. And then gradually we can lead, that can lead, sorry, to change. I think trade unions right now are doing a good job. The problem is that uh, most of that work is between trade unions and the authorities, the government. And uh, there seems to be very little interaction between trade unions and people themselves, workers themselves. Uh, I think that is sad. I mean, I know the trade unions are working uh, 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 here and CJIL has been uh, working with the government and has achieved a lot. But I think we have to be seen as defending also mostly the rights of the people, uh, defending wages, defending the, 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 the need for people to have money. Uh, and that is how we can hopefully uh, move away from uh, the current situation and, and finish this whole crisis with a, a very clear message. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Paolo. And now it's uh, time for listening to Hugo and see what uh, the Bloco thinks about. And not only the Bloco, but Hugo first. Um, yeah, hi uh, everyone. Uh, well, um, 
First of all, let me point out uh, uh, with Harris also a clearly optimistic uh, option concerning this panel's uh, title. Uh, optimism of the will, building hope, uh, intentionally uh, and spicing it with the hope. What is what it is silent or erased, it is the other part of Gramsci's sentence, uh, pessimism of the intellect. Uh, I also hope not to be too pessimistic in order not to disappoint this uh, positive option or, or way. Um, there are several uh, levels of responses, uh, several ways uh, to deal with, uh, with this crisis. Each and every level didn't have a proper answer uh, in my point of view. Uh, let me first speak about some strategic uh, challenges and uh, also pointing, pointing out what Tian uh, said. Um, and we must, uh, thinking also about uh, a French philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, we must not to be wrong in the ways of being right. And I think that is one of the uh, challenges. Uh, there is, of course, a necessity of uh, emergency support and measures that restrain the crisis uh, effect. Uh, but social uh, inequality, uh, precarity, uh, weak states are prior to the crisis, and that is the big issue. Uh, the strategic answer would be uh, the protection of labor, uh, of economy, the enforcement of health system and care, and we need to, in another level, to reinforce support to precarious workers and to prohibit dismissals, uh, to reinforce an employment allowance, mm -hmm. uh, to provide universal access to water, electricity, uh, preventing cuts, pro cuts, cuts from providers during this uh, stage, to support health system enlargement, uh, either by having better conditions to health workers in public hospitals, but also allowing civil requisition of private health infrastructures. It is immoral what happens by now in Portugal with private institutions actually having profit with the pandemic uh, crisis. Of course, uh, we, are, uh, uh, we, we were asked about then, we are dealing with uh, the social movements and the social movement challenges. Uh, what we experience by now is uh, lacking conditions to organize workers. Uh, we have a delay uh, on the matters that are easily captured by far right, uh, that is uh, feeding on discontent. Uh, right now, we are limited on our rights of demonstration and we lack the streets. Uh, the, consequen the consequences is the rise of the inorganic with all its uh, democratic uh, dangers. This is by now a big concern. Of course, there are other concerns associated. People, like Tanai just said, are tired and uh, uh, more and more desperate. Um, then there is the big effects of the crisis that didn't even started. Social movements are uh, alive, are emerging, but, but the conditions are uh, too difficult. The ability to appropriate inorganic discontent during confinement will be the big uh, issue. Uh, even so, uh, some positive and uh, interesting results, mainly in, cultural, in culture and art sectors in, uh, in Portugal. Um, we have the organization and we have uh, the... Uh, the claimings of uh, some uh, art and culture sectors, uh, namely in Porto, for example, uh, Casa da Musica and uh, Serralves that uh, um, really uh, fought uh, some, um, some um, labor injustice that, uh, that they dealt with. Uh, and, but on the other hand, I think there are, there are bigger problems regarding social composition in other sectors. Um, Marga mentioned it also, uh, precarious, precarious workers of uh, restaurants and bars and what the neoliberal would say, the private entrepreneurs or la petite bourgeoisie uh, march together by now. Um, 
what I ask is, are they claiming for the same objectives? And how can we capture, capture those uh, different uh, levels of objections? So, of course, uh, answering directly to the question, I'm not satisfied, but the, uh, the second question is, is it possible to be satisfied during these particular conditions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's see if we have. Uh, I see only one question that uh, is presently. It's uh, directed to Paolo. And uh, uh, the question is what kind of, of good job? Uh, have the, tra the Italian trade unions uh, done for women female workers? Uh, Paolo. No, le, le sindicate Italian il ha, il ha demandé e the ottenu... Italian trade unions have demanded and obtained, by the way, that no one uh, loses our job, so no redundancy. And we have short-term, part-time uh, uh, unemployment uh, uh, systems in place. And I think this is uh, an important dimension. Just to give you an example, my son works in a small shop with four other colleagues. Nobody there is a member of a trade union, nobody there uh, is involved in any sort of trade union activity. Uh, but my son is now technically unemployed, he hasn't lost his job. And that is because, uh, you know, there was disagreement with the government, uh, whereby people would not be made redundant. Okay, it uh, uh, is something that uh, is still in place, we want this to be continued for the whole of 2021. Uh, and I think this is uh, an achievement. It's a good thing. Now, obviously, yes, there are some redundancies here and there, but we don't have half a million uh, redundancies, you know, which would have happened without disagreement. And that is an achievement. What does not work, though, is uh, the fact that the people, the Italians, do not understand that this is the result of a demand presented by trade unions to the government. Uh, people are not aware of that. Uh, this whole thing was negotiated, uh, was the result of unions negotiating with the state, but nobody knows about this. Uh, so that's why I said trade unions did a good job here in Italy. Now, I think what's also important is to uh, really uh, show what happened and how we arrived to that sort of positive situation. And I hope in the coming months, this is something that will be discussed quite widely. I think the employers' organizations uh, are now demanding an end to that uh, prohibition uh, to make anybody redundant. They say this is a socialist policy. Uh, we have, we should have the possibility to uh, fire people. Uh, now, we agree with the trade unions that this uh, protection must be maintained uh, for the long run. Okay, that's uh, hey, okay. <laughs> what I wanted to say. Thank you. Good. Uh, well, uh, I think now we have some time for exchanging views uh, among ourselves. I will make a start in order uh, to, to just uh, help uh, the, the discussion. And uh, <clears throat> just, I'm just thinking if uh, the left, either in government or supporting in government, uh, is more capable than the right to deal with the pandemic. It seems that uh, taking the distinction that Danai has put between the first and the second wave, because in Greece that makes a lot of difference. <coughs> <coughs> During the first wave, we had uh, 
very big problems in Italy, in Spain, less in Portugal and much less in Greece. Which means that if we look at that and you compare what the others have done as with what a Greek right-wing government has done, it seems that the right-wing proved to be much more capable to deal with the problem. Uh, things are not the same now, nowadays. I don't know, but I, I will come to this in the second session regarding the European Union. I don't, I don't know how much the, uh, the second wave was a result of the first uh, due to the EU intervention, but uh, th this is not for this time. But let's, let's try to answer my first uh, to, 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 I want your remarks to my first observation. Well, I mean, what's, what's happening? And this is uh, the, the reason why, uh, Marga, I was intentionally provocative. What has your government done? The, because you know something, in Greece, when there is a discussion in the parliament and Tsipras says something against the government, then the prime minister, and uh, not only the prime minister, but also uh, some sometimes uh, people from uh, uh, the social democrats uh, say to him, "Yeah, but look what your comrades in in, uh, in Spain have done. I mean, they are worse than we are here." So, at least three of you can give an answer. Let me start because uh, I'm a Spanish. And uh, as all the audience know, we have in Spain a progressive government, it's a coalition among the social democrats. And Unidas Podemos, together we can, which is also a coalition between United Left and Podemos. So, and we have some ministries here, and it was like a surprise because we have the, the first progressive government in 80 years in Spain uh, in February, and the pandemic started in March. So it was like a shock for the progressive government and all the program we approved to implement uh, during this progressive government. So we must change uh, very quickly and to adapt to uh, this uh, new situation. Honestly speaking, I don't think Harris, it is uh, fine or not to make a real correlation among the numbers of infected people and the, the uh, right or wrong of the policies implemented. I mean, I think we need a long term and also to see not only the infected people, which is a virus question, it's a scientific question, but also with the impact or uh, how to dismiss diminish sorry the impact in the in the popular classes i honestly think in the first way the spanish progressive government did it quite well i mean in terms that immediately we created something like a social shield to protect the more vulnerable people you know typical keynesian if you want uh, policies in order to spend money i mean to uh, forbidden uh, to kick off people of the employment to give money for the autonomous people things like that the problem is that after the first wave finished, which is finished in Spain very quickly, by the way, in July, in terms that there was no restriction after the first wave, uh, now we are facing how can we deal as something that I mentioned before. The idea is how to something like to keep the economy running, uh, running, running while uh, meanwhile we are protecting people at the same time. And this is where now had is the big issue arose, I think, all around, all around Europe. All government, not all governments, the majority of the governments in Europe, independently of being uh, progressive or conservative, in a way or in another, are implementing Keynesian policies. In terms that it's clearly that the government needs uh, public expenditures in order to protect people and also to redirect the economic effects of the pandemic. And I think that is going to put us in front of a mirror to say if we are leftists want to go beyond Keynes and uh, beyond the idea of using the state only to deliver money for the weaker sectors, which is more or less what almost all governments are doing. And in that sense, I think, uh, honestly think that the existence of the Spanish progressive government is helped, sorry, has helped 
the European Union to shift a little the neoliberal uh, austerity measures in terms of the recovery funds, for instance. No? All the debate we have between the North and the South, uh, you know, the frugal countries and the South uh, with Portugal and Spain. So, but I, I think this is part of the class struggle, as you know, and I think we are facing now the need of the necessity for the radical left to go beyond to go beyond this uh, logical of the Keynesianism, because we know that the neoliberals wants to use this Keynesian measure only as a bracket, like as a small parenthesis to come back later to the stability pact. Yeah? So I think it's a real challenge, not only for a theoretical issue, but also to debate with our political parties to push. Okay, we will right deal with this in the, in the second part of our discussion regarding Europe. Uh, what about the others? Uh, or questions I, that the others want to put. Can Italy, I say? Yeah, Portugal. Yeah, okay. No, just just one or or, or two um, words. Um, I think uh, well, um, answering directly to one of uh, some some things that you said, Aris. I, I think a, a leftist uh, position uh, is all about the ability of uh, being together. Uh, and of course, uh, a social distancing virus is always a right-wing virus. Uh, that uh, uh, more or less justifies also the, the, the supposed competence to deal with a virus by the right-wing positions or uh, governments. But um, even uh, uh, regarding from a Portuguese, uh, Portuguese point of view, uh, I think there is a, um, uh, two velocities, two speeds, clearly uh, uh, around uh, around uh, the, the issues of tackling the crisis. On the first wave, there was a big consensus, uh, and there was not only a big consensus of uh, having to close down the economy to to go to the confinement, uh, but uh, also there was a, a clear even uh, disputable, always disputable, but clear position and way uh, led by the, by the government. The second wave is clearly different. It is right now a time bomb uh, because there is not a clear uh, way uh, given by the government. There, there, are, there, are, there are frightening numbers right now uh, in, uh, in Portugal. Uh, and there is double criteria about what should stay open and what sh should stay closed, and people don't understand that. Even that, and even concerning our first question of the of the panel, uh, what we uh, what we see is something very dramatical. It is the consequences of giving the main political discussions to social media instead of. Uh, uh, streets and uh, meetings and people uh, and and places where people meet, um, because uh, that is clearly uh, a right wing and worth a far right uh, nest uh, to grow upon, and and I think that is quite troubling. Does that's thank you. Does anybody want to put questions uh, to? Marga or to Hugo, Hugo or to Danai or uh, among yourselves, any anything uh, Harris, that can you I want to know? Comment ah, shortly about yes, what please, you said. please, please, Danai. I I wanted to to make like um, three remarks. The first one is that we can't measure the results only based on COVID cases or deaths of people. I mean we have to wait and see the result in the long run because the spread of the virus is not only defined by politics, but it's also defined by objective situation in every country. So I think we should wait. Uh, the second remark is that uh, we see a distinction, we must uh, see the distinction between uh, a Keynesian rhetoric and Keynesian policies. I don't think that conservative governments will follow till the end at least those emergency Keynesian policies. We see it in Greece. They started, the prime minister started by stating that he will spare no costs for saving lives, but then he changed his mind and he adopted the view of herd immunity because we need for the economy to, to work. So 
I, I think that they might um, speak like Keynesians, but they are not even that. And the third remark is what Marga said, all uh, governments of the left in Europe are rel relatively um, young ones. They, they have a short time in, in government. Uh, and so the, they have to work with the structure of the economy they inherited. I mean, in Greece, I, I was thinking what would Syriza do if they were in government and uh, the, um, uh, Alex Tsipras has given some examples, but the truth is that we cannot still answer since we don't, didn't have the time to transform the structure of the economy. An economy based by a quarter of its GDP on tourism would have a strong pressure on, on opening the, the borders, on opening the, the tourist economy. So um, we, we opened the discussion about transforming the economy as MPI we organized in the summer uh, a discussion on this. I think we should also um, a bit give, give this credit to, to left governments. I mean, it, it is too soon to have uh, results on this. Okay. Well, I have a very interesting question, so I just uh, I'm, I will try to extend a little bit uh, the time allotted to Marie, this first part. Yes? Uh, there are some questions in the Q&A yeah. box. Yeah, maybe. that's what I've seen, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, uh, especially the first one is directed to Marga, and uh, I, I think it's very interesting. Uh, Danai had already showed uh, her solidarity with uh, fellow uh, parties, uh, the fellow left parties, and it's okay. But now we have uh, a question which is rather critical uh, to Marga. Don't you think that Unidas Podemos is not putting enough pressure on uh, PSOE in order to take more progressive policies and that this could make Unidas Podemos look like they have come to be convenient with the economic system? Of course, this is a general question if it is not addressed for the pandemic period. But anyway, Marga, you can give a short answer, very short one. I think that uh, not at the moment, at the moment. I think the typical contradiction ever existed with a radical left go into a government, particularly when a coalition with the Social Democrats, we were very aware about this. I mean, all, all the contradictions exist in there. I think the question is that we signed a, a political agreement with the Social Democrats, and uh, our task as Unidas Podemos is to push to make real that political agreement. At the moment, has not been broken totally. So I think the majority of the population, even the voters of Unidas Podemos, is seeing Unidas Podemos in the government as a positive thing particularly because of labor ministry, which is really an excellent ministry who is protecting working class, confronting with the uh, owners of the companies, particularly because of her. But I don't know what is going to happen in the future. So probably in the future, if the growing demand for social measure is on the streets and also in, the, in other fields, probably will be, or we will see a differences more clearly inside the government of Spain. But particularly, I don't think now, sectors of the population see the participation of Unidas Podemos in the government as something bad. On the contrary, I honestly think so. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we can stay anymore. Uh, there is also another remark which could be uh, answered or commented by, but we don't have uh, time. We are constrained by the time allotted to the session. So we go to the second part of it and hope uh, that this time there will be more exchange uh, of views between the participants. Um, well, the question is very short, uh, but it has something behind it. Uh, the question is, in the face of the triple crisis, is there a need for the transformative left uh, to change or amend its strategy towards the European Union, and in what way? Uh, you know, what is behind this is that, uh, well, for example, uh, first of all, the, there is not a unique stance of, of, of all constituents of the transformative left towards uh, the EU. We know, we, we listened, uh, we have seen the differences before 
in the previous session, uh, we could uh, distinguish some differences. But uh, anyway, we've got some new things. Uh, what Walter said in the previous session, that for the first time uh, the EU tried and in a way acted earlier and in a way more efficiently uh, than uh, in, in the previous crisis uh, with this recovery fund and all that. But uh, at the same time, what I would like to, to, to say, uh, and uh, I made a hint before, is that uh, I believe that after the first wave in which some governments uh, tried, like the Greek one or the Portuguese one, tried to, to act uh, uh, quickly and, and very strictly in terms of uh, a total lockdown in order to save lives, lives from the pandemic, okay? Uh, the second wave, I believe, that uh, during the second day, I believe that there was an intervention from the part of the European Union, to, which was, please open your economies, okay, carefully, but open them. Uh, in the Greek case, it was obvious, I don't know if it was uh, some kind of directive from, uh, the, from Brussels, but anyway, the government thought that uh, they could open the economy, especially for tourism. And I mean, so I believe that in the second wave, uh, the, the economistic approach of the European Union uh, gave more priority to the economy than to health. With the result that now, uh, again, we have uh, uh, all governments of the EU becoming even more uh, restrictive than in the first wave in order to save the lives of the people. Uh, so, uh, we know, uh, coming back to the original question, we know that uh, the various parties of the transformative left have various positions towards the EU. Uh, what about, uh, I mean, was there any kind of change uh, during the pandemic to, of, of this uh, strategy? Any kind, well, for example, we heard uh, uh, Yorgos Katrugalos in the previous session saying, speaking about the need of an alliance with social democracy, the Greens, and of course, trade union social movements. And the same was, uh, was told by, by Heinz Birbaum. I mean, do, do we agree with all this? Starting first, if they, you see that there is a change of attitude. Marga. Marga? Yes, sorry, I was open my microphone. Oui, désolé, j'étais en train d'allumer mon micro. Harris. Je pense que quand l'humain fait face à une crise mondiale telle que celle-ci, et quand on voit que presque tout le monde dans le monde fait face à ce genre de difficultés, quelles sont les limites du climat, est-ce qu'on va dans la bonne direction a change in the way we understood politics and before. No? The same with the European Union. I honestly think that uh, European Union was a failure project it, before the crisis, and in this crisis, tried to correct just a little in order to create some kind of solidaristic fund or something, in order to have some, some sense to live. Because if we don't act as a European Union in a cooperative way, what we, do we want a European Union for? No? So uh, I, I'm sure there will be some changes, not only in politics, but in the way the people understand the necessity of collaboration. As in the previous session, we, are, uh, we were very clear about that there is no national exit of any, this kind of crisis. I mean, there is 
not only because the world is absolutely globalized in terms of economics, so it's really very impossible that one nation project existed, I mean, uh, aside from the rest of the world, but particularly on the contrary, because this crisis put on the table the necessity of more collaborative politics than ever among human beings. Now, uh, Actually, we don't see this kind of solidaristic policies all around the world, and this is one of the problems we are facing, I'm sure of that. So what is the solution? I don't know, but I think Juan Carlos Monedero, Professor Juan Carlos Monedero this morning, talked about the idea for the radical left to think or rethink, I must say, in the idea of changing Europe in the, in the path of a new constitutional process something like that we need a new treaty of the union, another kind of integration process based on democratic basis, which means clearly a constitutional process or something like that. Are we going to dare to imagine something like this? I think this is the time. As you know better than me, a crisis, which is a word originally a Greek one, means also uh, take a decision because something has been broken, you must take a decision on this. No? Uh, and this is like a crossroad no? to take a decision where are we going to be. And clearly I, I see, and uh, maybe I don't have time, but I would like to see it, the, the cracks I see inside the neoliberal hegemony uh, in the Western world and particularly in Europe. I think we are not in the same position like before the crisis. I, I see the cracks and even the breaks inside the neoliberal project. And I think this is an opportunity for all of us. Honestly, I think so. Okay. Uh, I have disappeared from uh, the screen. I don't know why, but anyway, there is no problem. You can hear me. Come uh, back, Alex. So it's Jan now. Okay. Uh, uh, I will speak in French for this one because it's, it's hard. Okay. <laughs> um, All right. But first, it is hard for the left to understand that this crisis is linked to the European crisis. It's hard for the national groups in the different countries to understand that their crisis is linked to the European crisis and due to European matters. As Marga said, there is no national exit to this crisis, no national solution to it. So the EU is in a bad shape. And because of that, the left doesn't have an instrument for collective sovereignty. This is what is at stake now at the European scale. It's all played at the European scale. And what's harder to understand for the EU is that its crisis is linked to the left crisis, the crisis of the left, because today it is true. It is the crisis today is due to the, the weakness of the left. Why? And all studies show that we'll have a study with Transform that will prove it. We'll not be the first ones to do it, by, uh, by the way, but the only political strength that is able to promote the mutualization of European strength is the left. The center, the liberals are completely unable to do it from an ideological viewpoint. They don't have the social basis, a voter's basis to create a European project for, that comes with a 2.0, a second generation. The only political forces that could accept such an authentic and genuine European project, which is about mutualizing forces and cooperation, and even defending the European idea that's the left, the left forces. And polls after polls, we see that the left is the only force that could do it. It is because it is that of international solidarity. It is not strong enough, but this is the one that most focus on international stakes. And so today, to truly, really generally uh, defend the European project, you will have the left. And Europe, uh, and Europe has a hard time seeing that because it's, it's quite novel. So now precisely, what can we do with the left now? What can the left do? Because we need to make sure that we have this feeling that we are successful. We have uh, won on mutualizing, sharing the debt, and maybe we could have the feeling that the left's claims 
our demands have been met, partly at least at the European level. Now, we see it is not true, and why? Well, we see it because the current financing plan for the debt will be financing European inequalities, will be financing a north-south, north-south asymmetry. So we'll keep the status quo in the capitalistic rationale. So what is really important for the left, I believe, is that we work on this open window. There's this question about the currency, about the debt. So what can we do? Well, we need to show that this mutualization project of the debt, the project that, as Hugo said it before, we need to accept and claim that we're from the left and that we want to do things together, with this financing plan should actually solve internal problems within the EU. So the countries in the South should not buy by increasing their debt and they should not buy uh, industrial and health products from the countries in the North and increase their debt. Otherwise we'll increase the gap and the debt is, not, is there to fund inequality, increase inequality, then the production model. That's another matter because you can say, okay, it's COVID and climate change is no longer a priority, but it is not true. Damages caused by climate change are to be taken or dealt with today. So the current model should deal with this reorientation of the production to make it greener. Now we see that all those themes and the links between what we are funding and the societal project, all this has been pushed away by the states. The states want, want a new type of financing to actually save the, the base ground of the system, the rationale of the system. They are looking for a temporary solution, but on the left, our purpose should be different. We need to go back to the top of the economic uh, activities. We need to tackle the inequalities between people and regions. And it's also about the model that we need to find for all countries because the environment needs a model. So it's not just about the, the gap between the North and the South but it's also a, a problem on our continent. So this should be our task. Today, our challenge for the left when we need to with the European matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Danai now. Uh, thank you, Harris. Since uh, I tend to agree with much of what Marga and Jan already said, I will make only four special points, let's say. Uh, first point, it is um, true that the pandemic did not cause the, the crisis of the EU, but it did highlight and uh, speed up all the deficits, all the dead ends the EU was facing. The, Comrades before me mentioned uh, many of them, the inequalities, the democratic deficit, and so on, so, so, so on. Um, the second point is that uh, despite that, we must not forget where we stood just a few months ago. Uh, we must not forget how the EU treated uh, all the countries of the European South, especially Greece, uh, in 2015 and afterwards, how it treated Italy and the, um, the conflict there was with the budget, the Italian budget. Uh, we must not forget that the stability pact was treated like a sacred totem that no one should ever question or attempt to change. So I think we, we can uh, agree that the European elites of course, not because they changed their, their minds, their political minds, but because they feared that the whole uh, union might be contested, that might collapse, uh, took some even baby steps forward. So we can build on from this uh, point. Uh, the third remark I want to make is that, okay, it is an unpopular point of view. I'm glad that 
uh, Jan seems to share this. The um, uh, recovery fund is, okay, it is positive that we have for the first time uh, a mechanism of mutualization of debt and collective financing, blah, blah, blah. But the truth is that we have, uh, this uh, highlights the democratic deficit and the inequalities. I mean, uh, the, the whole uh, fund is designed uh, by the, um, the North for the North, all the, um, all the idea is to preserve capitalism and uh, to even uh, enhance inequalities. I usually refer to the example of uh, ele electronic mobility. I mean, no one in the South, no country in the South can produce electric cars. So what uh, these countries will do is to import them from the, uh, from the North. So um, this fact also puts uh, uh, even more um, strongly the question of democracy, of inequalities, and of how we should overcome the, the capitalism in total. And the fourth remark I want to make is that uh, I think Marga was the one who said that uh, um, the crisis and the pandemic proved that we cannot deal with uh, such a crisis on the national level. I want to add that it also proved that we are already in a, a very changing and very rapidly changing world. Uh, and so we have to start not only, um, we have to start thinking beyond the EU to, to overcome a Eurocentrism right now, because I think the EU is like aging and uh, I'm afraid that sometimes maybe the, the developments on the international level might leave us behind. So we have to think even broader than the EU. Thanks very much, Danai. You're always right with the time. Mm. Okay, Paolo. Uh, oui, merci. Bon, well, je suis thank you. Well, I agree with most of what I've heard so far. Uh, so like Marga said, there is no national exit to the current crisis. I have a question here. I think it is sure that the European leaders have changed their policies, but I'm not sure that the new policies will be a Keynesian enough from the left. They've changed. Now we need to understand why they've changed, but they're not taking to the left. They're not going left. Now, it appears obviously that the European treaties are liberal and they're designed to avoid left policies and Keynes uh, or Keynesians types of policies. It's obvious. So in Europe, this concretely translated into an austerity policy. This austerity policy has been questioned because of COVID. Because COVID came on top of that. And it's not about health or retirement only. It's the entire economic system that's collapsing if you keep the current austerity measures. And I believe that the European leaders have decided to strongly reduce, not and, but strongly reduce the concept of austerity, but they didn't want to exit neoliberal policies. And it is obvious, if you want to get out of this neoliberal work, you would have different policies where the money of the ECB, European Central Bank, would be invested mostly into the states and for the states to make, to make huge social rights policies. Now look at where the money is going, and this money from the ECB. This is money that costs nothing. Is that right? Well, that money coming from, in, from the ECB will fund the financial and the productive markets. Not, the money is not going to the states or to public health care. Now, look at the financial markets. There's something funny. 
about that because we're in the midst of a pandemic and the financial markets are doing fine. You have this quarter that we just finished for the US and Europe. It was very good on the financial markets. Why? Simply because there's a lot of money there, which is free, zero interest, and they use it to fund their stuff. So Keynes was a liberal, I believe, but he was asking the question about the euthanasia of those living from their dividends. What we see here is the opposite of Keynes. Okay, we need to look into that. Otherwise, we will think that all policies which are not austerity are directly left-wing policies. No, these are positive policies if they are not about austerity, but Merkel and Macron will carry out an economic and productive policy, will put at the center of everything the issue of Europe in the crisis of globalization. So these policies will have a strong impact when it comes to production and they need a policy to expand the monetary side, but this is not a left-wing policy or Keynes type of policy. And I will conclude by saying this. I believe that we need to exit this thing. I don't want to only exit austerity. We need to go beyond austerity. And we need to use our economic resources to do welfare, to do environmental uh, retrofitting of the production tools. We need to change the programs. We need to set left objectives, left-wing objectives, and set the role of the state to, use, to, to manage this huge amount of money. Otherwise, the risk is that the states will spend, but it will take two or three years, and then in two or three years, they will start reducing those expenses, and we have not done welfare, we have done, not done the green reconversion or retrofitting, and we've not done he public health for all. So it's about setting the priorities. And as a European left, we need to take a European stance and a stance that will say, look, look, they did good work. No, we can do a lot more with the money available, the money that they're using now for the markets. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's true regarding the markets. Uh, there is a rating company that upgraded Greece during this disaster, uh, economic disaster at this time, because it's okay for them, as you said, no problem. Um, well, Hugo. Hugo. Uh, well, I don't think uh, a transformative left should change uh, policies towards Europe, because I don't recognize any particular change concerning Europe. Uh, namely concerning Europe solidarity, uh, European economy, balance of powers, or democratic internationalism. Uh, this uh, crisis reveals a structural weakness of uh, European uh, solidarity, prevailing the greed of the ruling class uh, and of economic and social unfairness. Uh, once more, this pandemic crisis reveals prior and structural problems that now attack with bigger intensity. Um, to fulfill the, the example, we can see all the disputes and negotiations around the European Recovery Fund, uh, narrow and insufficient, but still a necessary support. Um, the agreement that led to, to the European Recovery Fund is surrounded by uh, economic competition uh, with the neoliberal euro prevailing once again. Uh, it opens the door to an Europe divided between the strong and the weak and for a state budget future uh, interference. Recently, we saw an outrageous defeat concerning the rules of this recovery fund that does not exclude uh, fossil fuel industries from its uh, support, 
uh, transferring decisions to the European Commission. Secondly, uh, we should worry about a punitive rule now impending above states that do not fulfill a not particularly clear evaluation criteria by the Commission. It seems that uh, for Europe is business as usual beyond uh, uh, democracy. Uh, uh, this panel's title uh, starts by quoting Gramsci. Uh, I'll go with the flow saying that once again, what we call European integration deals with a great variety of morbid symptoms. Um, so no, uh, sorry if I seem too pessimistic, but the structural uh, democratic problem is a long-term problem for Europe. Uh, it didn't start with pandemic and with pandemics, and so it doesn't imply uh, any specific answer. Uh, we should, of course, fight for internationalism. This means to admit that we need a democratic base to build this internationalism in fairness. Uh, maybe uh, the general uh, answer is it is in, uh, in once again in our panel's uh, title: uh, an internationalism or a new Europe for and by. Uh, the left. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I was uh, told by Angelina that there are some questions, which in fact, I don't know for what reason, I cannot see, I've just seen uh, the question addressed to, to, to Marga. So uh, I urge you to, to exchange views among yourselves, to put questions to each other, please. I'm sure that you have some questions. I just wanted to, to debate with Hugo about the question yes, of... Yes, I cannot yeah. hear you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to debate a little with Hugo Monteira about the question of, of Europe. I think, uh, Hugo, what uh, some of us try to say is not that we don't agree with the criticism of the European Union as exists today. We know that the European Union today is a, is a neoliberal tool and actually is an instrument used by capital to implement criminal policies like in Greece uh, during the last crisis. Not what, or what uh, I would like to stress is the idea that it's very difficult for me to understand a radical left position uh, on national basis only. It's like, I don't know how to say it, in a globalized world, economically globalized world, I mean, there is no other action, economically speaking, I'm talking about policy, economically speaking, but in integration economic model or processes, not like ICTs today, but clearly, uh, we need more that international solidarity. I mean, it's a question of material basis of how the uh, economic cycles must run with, even with owner property by the state or collective property. I mean, it's a question of how the world must run for us. If we imagine a society, integrated society, we must go beyond the European Union, as I said before, clearly. Uh, but at the same time, I don't imagine a national base only uh, solution. Uh, for, for this problem. It's, it's a scientific question. It's not about a moral position. Honestly, I think so. Yes, me neither. Uh, uh, I agree with you. Uh, my, my answer was not uh, uh, trying to put a solution on a, on a national level. I, I also don't agree with that. Even, uh, well, I'm an internationalist also. It is, uh, but um, but uh, the issue is that uh, is that I, I think that there are ways for us to build uh, European solidarity, but uh, they are fatally counter institutional, and I think that is that is one of the big issues. For example, uh, when we uh, when we try to answer a question, for example, of uh, what is called European integration. Uh, the, the temptation, it is always to put it in an institutional level. Uh, what kind of integration? Integration on the Europe as it is, on the European institutions as they are. Uh, and that is the, the deepness of my skepticism. It is about the institutions. The institutions, that's one, one of the 
the examples that 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 I gave keep uh, vaccinating themselves to uh, uh, democratic processes and to transparent processes. Uh, so I think there is a lot to do uh, in terms of uh, our relationship as uh, as uh, uh, European uh, radical left militants. Uh, and there is a lot, a lot to do, but always counter-institutional. I think so. My well, skepticism is about institutions. Well, for example, uh, I mean, I, I, I take the point from where you left it, uh, Hugo. I mean, what should the left and social movements and trade unions do regarding the vaccination thing? I mean, when the vaccine comes, uh, I mean, will this be equally distributed to to the countries which need it more, or, or will it uh, stay where it has been produced and uh, mainly in the north, for example? Or uh, I mean, th this 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 thing needs some kind of extra institutional intervention because otherwise we have to to put uh, our trust to our leaders and to the European Commission, which I don't have, for example. W what do you think about that? About some kind of international cooperation during the crisis, during this crisis? The question yes. goes to all of you. Huh? But, but in, uh, sorry, just to, just to, to go with the, with the flow, I, I, I totally agree with, with your uh, concern. Uh, mainly because what we uh, what we are seeing right now uh, it is uh, the lobbying and the pharmaceutical uh, lobbying uh, installing quite clearly uh, in a in a, in with the intentions of profit. Uh, so it is time clearly to fight. It is time clearly to fight and clearly to fight in a collective and internationalist level. Uh, I don't know how to translate that into effective uh, positions and measures concerning the actual uh, uh, institutional uh, disposition of Europe. And that is one of, uh, uh, let's say, my, my issues. Anybody else? Okay. Yes, Jan, yes, yeah. Jan. Uh, I, I will take I will take it in front in French. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, la, la question du vaccin que tu poses, the question allez. the matter of the vaccine yeah. is crucial. It will be a crucial political battle, not about health only. To be a crucial battle because the far right wing, globally speaking, through people like Trump, have used the project of the vaccine as a tool, a tool to say that we could change nothing in the system. We'll have a vaccine soon, a technical solution. The, the far right wing globally and the conservatives have used the excuse of the vaccine as a political project. And they said they didn't want to change our economic habits or ways to go. Now. The vaccine will come, we hope, and will, there will be a conflict, the one you have just explained. There will be inequalities. Even when there is a vaccine, it will not be the solution to the crisis because inequalities will remain. And it will cause inequalities that will be determining. So the only way to go from the left, the vaccine is from the left. But the only way for the left to use it as a left-wing tool to take it out of the Trump project is to fight this battle of inequality. Otherwise, well, you have this ideological attack by the right and the far right saying that they would be the leaders to take us out of the crisis with the vaccine will be justified. And there will be an increase, a strong increase in inequalities. So it is highly necessary that we work on the vaccine to get the vaccine first, but this should be in 
uh, linked to an international cooperation project. Otherwise, in fact, and ideologically speaking, it will confirm the reign of liberalism and the far right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Angelina, do we have a, can we take one question, not more than one, unfortunately? Well, we, there is only one question that I think it fits better in the next session, since now we are ah. discussing, yes, we are in a particular route in the conversation. Um, mm -hmm. I think that uh, if we have time, okay, so we have time, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Um. And it, well, it starts from various debates um, that the Greek left, um, I think, has. And uh, by left, I mean from Syriza to um, the various uh, organizations of the extra parliamentary left mosaic. Um, but I think there are, uh, we face some big divisions within the left stance uh, with regards to the pandemic. On the one hand, um, okay, with regards, for example, on how we do politics, when we do have uh, restriction measures, okay, we are now facing in Greece a, on a, an almost a complete ban on movement, for example, okay, in uh, three days from now, we used to have this uh, anniversary of the Polytechnic School Riots, that is used to be a big event for all the Greek left. It is a point of reference, okay. And we used to have a- oh, 40, 46 years of 46. marches continuously, yes. every year for 46 years, yeah. marches from the Polytechnic to the American Embassy. I mm -hmm. mean, it's, it's a memory that stands the, the, the passing of time. Yes, and it's not only a demonstration, it is a three days um, um, events, discussions, debates, uh, people go to the old Polytechnic school and visit exhibitions, etc. So um, this year, um, it, uh, oh, the whole of the left knew that uh, they will probably uh, forbid the demonstration because we have a restriction of movement and because this demonstration is a very massive one. So yes, epidemiologically speaking, it is not a good idea, so to say. Uh, but the government did the, cho chose not to announce uh, um, um, in very direct way that, okay, we forbid the demonstrations, but they somehow implied it. That, okay, uh, in, the in the last months of our lives, we chose not to celebrate the national anniversaries, etc. We didn't celebrate our Eastern, so also this is the case for the 17th of November. But now yesterday we had um, an incident with uh, fully armed cops entering the Polytechnic School that was actually closed for celebration reasons and only part of the personnel um, teachers and researchers were there because they were working. and. Um, just starting arresting people that had entered the Polytechnic School in order to start, so to say, manifestations. Anyway, there is a huge debate now. The, a, a, a big part of the left is actually calling for a massive demonstration to happen because now they think this is even more needed, this demonstration to take place as a response to the government's decision and to the police violence, etc. Uh, another part of the left, which is also a part of the left that used to say months, uh, months, weeks from now that, okay, we should not organize a demonstration this year and we should, uh, I don't know, think about alternatives, events, etc. continues uh, supporting such position. So um, I would like to, 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 to see your perspective and your, and your views upon that, because it is true that uh, right-wing governments are actually waiting the left in the corner every day. They are waiting in the corner for us. I mean, then I already said that they are already accusing us that we are part of the anti-vaccine movement, that we are anti part of the anti-corona movements. So organizing, for example, a big demonstration, maybe in terms of political, democratic, etc. reasons, it's reasonable for our discourse and our tradition, but on the other hand, it's somehow 
we play, I don't think, do we play the, uh, the government's games or not? If we do proceed on such acts. Yeah, I, I just want to see your views upon this. And sorry, because I was very, very long. <laughs> yeah, but in order not to, to speak only about the Greek case, uh, okay, we can start from, from there, because of course it's something, it's a burning question, so a question for all of us. Uh, I think we should generally ask the panelists, uh, what is the position, what should be the position of the left, especially if it's not in government, uh, towards uh, the lockdowns? Because it seems that uh, every lockdown works against uh, not only uh, anniversaries like that, but also against uh, the working people. So what, what do you think should be done? Uh, and uh, what uh, Angelina said, it's characteristic of the difficult situation in which the left is in, uh, with which we will deal in the third session. Please. Can I start then? Marga. Just to share with you that uh, uh, we all know I don't that. hear you. Oh, shame. Can no, you hear me now? Yes. Ah, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, all of us uh, knows that science is not neutral. And uh, some political decisions has been taken on the basis of uh, science uh, on the epidemiological situation. And some of them has been really, really very terrible. Just to share with you, related with Angelina's question, is that in my city, in Madrid, a terrible government, uh, quite conservative of the region of Madrid, where the city is in, decided to lock down only the poor neighborhoods of the city in a clear, clear uh, elite or class perspective of the pandemic. So the, our people in, the, in these working class neighborhoods who has been locked down, of course, protested uh, about that. Protested and going to the streets saying why the poor neighborhoods and not the rich ones. Of course, the poor neighborhoods has uh, higher levels of infection logically because of the way of living and also because, and this is my key question, that even the hardest lockdown in this second wave allowed the working class to go to work. It's like going to work, it's outside the health system. No? It's like the majority of the workers still have to work. Uh, and this is something that draws me to the question, Angelina, that if we as leftists go to the street in a demonstration, meaning uh, defiant all the lockdowns or the restriction or health restriction, what, what a worker thinks about us? I mean, if he has to follow the rules and then suddenly see us on the street in a celebration. Uh, honestly, I don't think we must to follow these kind of things, uh, even if it is not easy. And we know that the class struggle is also in the de policy decision-making process during this pandemic. But you, we must to take into account what the workers think at every moment. That's my position. Yes. Anybody uh, else? Yes. Maybe well. I, I can uh, add something because I think the questions that that you pose uh, uh, the, in the way uh, that you pose the question, Harris. It, is, it makes it a very, very difficult question. Very yeah. difficult question. Um, even because uh, we must also um, define in what workers are we thinking uh, about when we call about the general word workers. Because, for example, we speak, of course, about the workers on the front lines of the, of the health systems that say, please stay at home because we can, cannot handle anymore. Uh, and, and we, of course, have, a, have also a responsibility uh, um, towards um, human life. So th there is a clear responsibility on, uh, on that. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, of course, um, the, the general lockdown, it, it is a class privilege. Uh, so we must also acknowledge the class privilege that that uh, is installed in the in the in the lockdown philosophy. Let us let us say. Uh, so I think it is a, a very serious one. Um, 
there is a, a, a sort of non-answer about the political uh, activity uh, possible in this kind of situation uh, that is precisely uh, putting some boundaries and some barriers about what is very organized and it, what is very unorganized. Uh, we have examples here in Portugal about uh, political uh, demonstrations, even political festivities. I'm thinking particularly upon uh, um, the Communist Party, the Communist Party uh, festival, the Avant Festival, that was extremely organized and that was really an example. Uh, at the same time, with the social media saying, this is going to be chaotic, those are irresponsibles, uh, they are, they are dis disrespecting uh, the society and all that stuff, and it was an example. Uh, at the same time, yesterday and as we speak, uh, we have right now a demonstration of uh, uh, restaurants and uh, restaurant workers uh, that are totally chaotic uh, and with uh, uh, with uh, serious uh, insurance concerns. Uh, so to say that, assuming uh, to assume that it is a very uh, difficult question doesn't have a linear uh, answer, and I think we must profoundly think about that. You have no sound, Lawrence, I think. Let me put let me put the third question and we can carry on the discussion we started now because uh, I mean things are related. I mean what what I want to ask you in this uh, final part of this session uh, is related to the discussion we have already started. Well, uh, Jan in uh, when we started, said that um, it is very difficult for the left to, to put its vision uh, these, these days when people uh, have in mind uh, that they want, when people want solutions to the problems that they face uh, this time. So, sorry about Poppy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and uh, of course, uh, well, people, for example, don't don't want a transformation at this moment. Don't don't think about it uh, because uh, the the sentiment that is prevailing is uh, mainly fear. Fear of the virus and fear of the loss of their job. Possibly the only section of the population which doesn't fear anything is the youth. Uh, and this is something that I also want to have a reference in, in, to, to refer to in, in, uh, in our discussion. So, Michael, the, the question is that, uh, well, if things are like that, uh, that we cannot put our vision, then we uh, are suffering a very big uh, defeat. Th that's what I believe. Because uh, we know very well that uh, what is happening, even the pandemic, is the result of the world capitalist system. We know that. We know that very well, and there are many contributions during this period from intellectuals throughout the world that have made this nitty gritty. But uh, so if at this time we cannot put <laughs> our, our view that capitalism should be transcended, we must have a post-capitalist, we must tend towards a post-capitalist society, then when? when? When can we put this? Anyway, uh, even if, so, I mean, are, are we, and I don't mean with that, that, just going out and state that what is needed 
in this period is to march towards socialism. No, this is silly and uh, as every sectarian statement. But uh, instead, for example, of, of, uh, of, uh, pro of just uh, speaking only for, for the implementation of Keynesian policies, I mean, like a bigger funding of the health system, incentive to companies uh, in order not to fire their staff, all, all these things. I mean, shouldn't we also try to introduce some other ideas, more, more radical, like uh, the need for economic planning, and more concrete, the socialization of the financial sector, or, or of the health and transport systems. Uh, I mean, which, I mean, all things related to the, the questions of ownership, and uh, uh, something which is absolutely necessary, which uh, the, the, the necessity of democratic decision making. I mean, if, if we cannot put these things on the table, then uh, I mean, I don't think that we should uh, retain uh, the, uh, the, the characteristic, the, the, the characteristic of, of uh, or claim that we are a transformative left. We are, well, a party, uh, we are parties and political forces that want good, nice amendments of the system, which is responsible for what is happening now. So let's open the discussion for this. Uh, until when? I don't know. Angelina, you tell us. Marga, please. Very briefly then, but it's a pity because it's true that this is a crucial question. It's just a, so let me start say by saying that uh, I honestly, not only me, of course, but there is a, a lot of people realizing that there is a, 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 a crisis of the neoliberal hegemony in terms of not only common sense of the whole of the population following those policies that has been imposed in the world, at least in the Western world for the last 50 years, but also because we see some cracks or some breaks in this uh, hegemony of neoliberalism, even in a cultural way. And I say this because we can understand and study how uh, there is no utopia for the liberals or for the neoliberals. I mean, there is no other future than the, future, the present as it is. No? It's like the neoliberalism also is only is imagining dystopias or world, uh, apocalyptic world, or even force us to live in another planet because they don't have a, 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 a future for, for, the, for now or, for, or for, for the world. And this is something very important. What I want to say is that what is in crisis is the capitalism, not our dreams or the way we understood the future must be, uh, not the values we defend. So maybe this is the right moment, as Harry suggested, to come back again to the basic questions, why we are leftist and why really we, we like to work internationally and solidaristic in order to improve the world. Harris Golemi's challenge us in Transform some weeks ago, uh, challenge us telling us, let's talk of the elephant in the room. No? Why we don't talk about socialism? Why we don't talk about a future society where socialism, ecology, and feminism can work together as the basement of the building of a new society. And I think this is the right time to do so. In, in, this is the moment where neoliberal cultural hegemony is not so strong, and is the moment where the whole population is asking itself about the civilization we are building because of this pandemic crisis. So it's the right moment to do, I think, this right question. It's not only a thing, and for us, uh, as uh, part of the radical left, it's the moment not only to come back to the previous models, on the contrary, to open the imagination of our will to the optimism of a better future, based on the idea, and I agree with Harris totally, to go to the real, real, I don't know, touchstone of capitalism, which is own property, is the question of private property. I mean, the question of fighting against the free market is the question is who take the decision and who was the owner of the resources that are created by the workers. 
uh, come back to this basic question because I think it's the moment uh, a lot of people will understand and create new solutions. I don't have the clear solution, but I have one clear solution. If we don't have one free market to rule our lives and to design the future, we must to come back again to the idea of a collective property, not only state property or nationalization, but the theory of the common goods would say that water, energy, housing has to be a common goods managed in a democratic way by citizens, for instance, and also with a combination with public sectors and of course a kind of planification, all democratic planification. Why not we talk about this? This morning, and I, this morning, and I finish with this, I was very glad to hear that Walter, uh, Walter Bayer talk about socialism, Heinz Biermann talk about democratic socialism, and I think it's the moment that we come back again to the challenge Harris made to us two weeks ago and talk about the elephant of the room, which is what kind of society do we want? Thank you. Jan. Okay, after uh, Harris and, and Marga, uh, I'm a bit, I must admit, I wasn't expecting to uh, uh, face that sort of question now. But if uh, I want to try and answer to that question, I think we have to be able to uh, face uh, the need for us to talk about the kind of society we need or we want. We need to be able to talk about communism as a way to break away from uh, the traditional type of economy. I'll take the example of the Paris economy. The Paris economy is totally dependent on tourism. If tourists come, I mean, if tourists come, we're fine. If they don't, well, all those uh, shopping malls uh, where you find thousands of uh, wealthy uh, foreign tourists, uh, those shopping malls are closed. Americans are not there, Chinese are not there, rich people do not come anymore. All of these workers employed uh, in those shopping malls and shops have lost their jobs. At least nobody comes anymore. And is the, 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 you know, the question is, should we open these malls again? Because then people will have a job? Or, uh, or should we not? Uh, and the problem is that as long as we don't have a clear vision of what type of society we want, then, uh, we'll always end up using the old uh, recipes again. That means let's fly people in to Paris and let them, uh, you know, let's make them spend a lot of money uh, and we're back into the, the, this capitalist system. Uh, so I think what we have to do is be able to face this responsibility that we have to talk about another types of society and say, yes, we have to go beyond the market economy and its priorities and they are bigger things than that. And I think what we need to do is free the minds uh, of people and explain to people that uh, you can live even if you don't sell yourself and if you don't submit. Uh, and I think that's my reaction. Danai? Yes. Um, the final question was the most in interesting one. So it's a pity we don't have enough time to discuss. So very quickly, um, I want to start by quoting um, Yerasmus Mosconas. Many of you met him in our seminar last year in Vienna. Uh, Mosconas wrote in, an, in a recent article that uh, in all likelihood, emergency Keynesianism shall once again rescue, as it did in 2008-2009, economic neoliberalism. Uh, so, um, to begin with, I think that there is no uh, future, not only for the left, but also for, for the society and the working class as such, uh, if we don't start questioning capitalism and going beyond Keynesianism. Uh, having said that, uh, I don't think, and I'm sure that Harris agrees, 
we don't have to, you know, uh, always uh, evoke socialism and speak about socialism, socialism, socialism. It's just uh, uh, opening cracks to to the the dominant logic, the dominant system uh, with our proposals. And I think we've started doing so, uh, both the organized left and the movements in Greece and in Europe. I mean, when we when we started uh, talking about the importance of workers in the care sector, it is uh, questioning the hierarchy of of labor capitalism produces uh, that uh, downgrades this this uh, kind of workers. Or when we start discussing about universal and conditional income, uh, when we start questioning the working time. These uh, all, all are um, demands and discussions that open serious cracks, or the the fact that the the left. Uh, I know that in Europe we we quest in Greece we question the structure of the Greek economy and the fact that it is based on on tourism. What uh, Jan was saying, and um, I could think of many examples. I don't want to to take much time or. Uh, the because there was a question, the, the, the question of who owns uh, crucial infrastructure, especially we've seen this with, with technological uh, networks and technological infrastructure, the question of data, the question of access, the question of cost, because right now students cannot uh, uh, access um, the internet to follow the, their schooling. So, all these are questions that open cracks in, in capitalism. In that way, I think we can move forward, uh, or, or even the, the discussion about uh, uh, ownership of scientific innovation and the dangers we discussed around the vaccine. Uh, I think we should start discussing about this. And one last remark, because I want to, to close optimistically. Um, Harry said he wanted to talk about the youth. We must not forget that the European youth, and especially the youth in the European South, has known nothing but the constant crisis, because they, they were born and raised and grew up in, in times of crisis. So I think that the, it is not only that they don't fear uh, for their health and their lives, they are what is the section of the population that is closer to what we say that they have nothing to lose uh, but their own chains. I mean, we have to to believe in them. And in Greece, we saw that they protested and they, they were very responsible and very, uh, they fooled us with hope. You can speak now, Paolo. Paolo, 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 it's Paolo's turn. Uh, oui, uh, moi je suis communiste. Yes, uh, I am a communist. But if we start talking about socialism and uh, uh, Keynes uh, and all that, we're not going to move forward. I think this is totally ununderstandable for most people. I think what we need to do is talk about the immediate solutions now. Today, not tomorrow, today. But of course, to do that, we need to think about what Lenin, when Lenin uh, did the revolution, he did it for peace and because he wanted the peasants to have land. And I think today, we have to avoid ideologizing transformation as a topic we have to ask concrete practical questions and questions that anybody else can think about but but big questions of course important questions if we say we want the whole of our health system to be publicly owned and if we say that and if we add to that that uh, it must be free okay it's a public Oh, publicly owned, you know, system. Everybody uh, should have access to health, and no money should go to the private health system. If we say that, then I think it's a message that makes a lot of sense. 
And no, that's I what probably I probably mean. think that's that 90% I mean. of the population will agree with that, by the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Transport, same thing, public transport. Uh, we can also, uh, uh, of course, say, okay, let's uh, reduce working time. Let's uh, allow people to retire at an earlier age. Uh, uh, we need to also think about the, the environment uh, and we don't want to destroy the planet. Those are radical questions. They are not ideological questions and they make sense to a lot of people in you know, our countries. And then one more thing. We've said, we've been told, sorry, uh, for 30 years, we can't spend money. We don't have money. We don't have enough money to finance our welfare systems. We can't go into uh, increasing our debt. Well, now we have the quantitative easing system, which has allowed us to spend money on everything. And so what we have to say is, okay, if suddenly we have money, I don't know where it comes from, but if we have money, let's use it for all these things that are common and not just give money to buses and company owners. And if we have money, let's not use it uh, to save banks. Let us use money to promote and support and build a genuinely effective health system. Uh, uh, and, and maybe that's a little bit populist and some will criticize this uh, proposal for that, but I think it's popular more than populist to me. And uh, you can't just say I'm left wing and uh, well, that's it. No, you have to come up with concrete proposals and you have to think about how we can maybe act to save mankind and save the environment. Okay, that's my thinking. We need to be clear. We need to be very easy to understand in our messages. And we have to say there is money. I mean, I don't understand again uh, why, but that money must not go to the banks. It has to go to things that are useful to people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, guys. And yeah. The, 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 yeah, yeah. It, uh, it's Hugo who will uh, make the last intervention. Uh, I ask you this because uh, my screen has uh, darkened. Uh, I just want to give the floor to Hugo and I want to put a small remark for his answer. So the remark is that all these concrete uh, points that were made by Paolo are not acceptable by the European Union or will be very difficult to be accepted. So please give your answer taking into consideration this remark also, Hugo, and thank you very much. Okay, what a, what a big responsibility. <laughs> but, uh, but well, I'll try to, to manage. Uh, I'm so sorry, I'm totally conditioned also by the Gramscian uh, uh, parti pris, the, the not uh, discussion, uh, no, I'm mixing language, sorry, uh, of no, our uh, conversation. Um, and I think it is time to uh, hegemonize from concrete proposals. I'm, I'm uh, a lot in agreement with, with what uh, Paulo just, uh, just said. Um, we must read uh, situation to enter in the movement of time and that is a big uh, challenge. Um, Portuguese revolution in 74 allows us to build a public uh, health uh, system continuously undermined by neoliberal uh, policies. It is time to regain uh, a strong public, public uh, answer to win not only this crisis, but also structural problems that this uh, crisis uh, reveals um, and uh, to leave no one uh, behind. Uh, some measures are essential, for example, uh, to force mandatory employment contracts with uh, platforms such as Glove or Uber, uh, to provide more time to unemployment allowance and support, namely reversing finally the rules imposed by Troika some years ago in Portugal, for example, uh, to provide better jobs uh, and employment conditions in public health uh, systems, and to interrupt bank uh, bailouts with the public funding, even uh, more immoral in a time of crisis. On the basis of dem demands such as these, uh, 
Well, uh, there are principles uh, that the transformative left should not uh, dismiss. We should insist into a new, uh, uh, now hegemonized consensus about public answers, so we can also hegemonize the view of a strong welfare state. Um, and it is now strategic to gain position on class struggle. Uh, of course, there are additional challenges. For example, it is our obligation to give voice to the outcast and silent majority of this crisis. Uh, we talked a lot uh, um, about older people, for example, about what to do to protect older people, but without in one single minute actually listening to older people. Uh, and we need to hear, and we need to hear uh, people. There is a paradigm to be changed around the, all the care system, network and structures, and we need to reinvent solidarity uh, and to change existential and rather paternalistic uh, model uh, around it. Um, and around what it means to, to care, to take care, to provide. We need to go beyond institutions without giving up on uh, institutions. This is, I think, a, a challenge. And uh, even going beyond institutions can be one of the answers of the of the very severe final ch uh, challenge that uh, Harris uh, uh, sent to me, because, uh, of course, um, Europe wouldn't agree with uh, any of our solutions. So it is time to go beyond institutions and to give uh, and, to, and to be cre creative about giving people concrete voice. Uh, giving voices to people and to empower uh, people towards uh, uh, new answers and new times. Okay, we have come to the end. Thank you very much, uh, all of uh, the participants, the people who attended uh, the event, uh, and uh, of course, uh, all the silent heroes behind the screens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have now. 15 minutes of break before we proceed to the next and final session that starts at 5 Central European time. It's called the Intervention Point and it is about presenting collect potential collective initiatives for the left in Europe. The moderator in this panel would be uh, the co-president of Transform, Connie Hildebrand. So as we did it in the previous break, you don't have to leave the event, just turn off your mic and uh, we see each other again in 15 minutes from now. <laughs>